The Tom Butler Organization Limited has been providing specialist equipment for control centers to a range of government departments for the past 10 years. It's become increasingly apparent that there's a lack of sound information and technical detail given to those who are undertaking the task of upgrading or totally rebuilding their emergency control centers. The purpose of this video is to help clients understand more clearly what's involved in the design and construction of this type of build. This video is in three sections. The first section will show you Northampton's control center. The second part was shot at various stages during the construction and highlights the key points. The last part deals with the actual installation procedure and is meant to aid those that are unfamiliar with the types of equipment that will need to be installed. Here in Northampton, they've just finished rebuilding their emergency control centre. It was incorporated as part of the design of the new Northamptonshire Records office. The actual design of the centre was based on the Tombot Mark II design and was modified to take into account the dimensions of the building above. This is the above ground door which leads to the centre itself. This is the entrance to the centre itself. The door here is 200 millimetres thick, it weighs nearly a tonne and it's designed to withstand a blast of three atmospheres. The first area you enter is the decontamination room. In this area, anyone who had to go outside would wash off any pollutants before rejoining the main control centre. Also sited off this area is the generator room. In an emergency situation, it would be regarded as a contaminated area. This is due to the large quantity of air that the generator requires for combustion and cooling. It would be uneconomical to gas filter this air. Therefore, the generator is placed in a totally sealed room and the air it requires is pre-filtered, eliminating dust and radiation only. The valves and filters on the air inlet and the valves on the air outlet all create resistance. Therefore, it's necessary that a chamber is built around the air inlet filters and that a mechanical fan is incorporated to overcome this air resistance. Flexible ducting is connected to the cooling system and outlet valves to ensure air is forced across the cooling coils and straight out of the room, minimizing any contamination. The generator exhaust is taken out separately through an insulated wall passage. The generator is the self-contained power source for the entire control center, providing the ventilation, power, heating, and lighting. From the decontamination area, we move through a second blast door into an airlock then through a pressure door and into the main centre itself. As you can see, the main control centre area has been left completely open plan, allowing use for a variety of purposes on a day-to-day -day basis. In an emergency situation, the team would need to be totally self-contained for 14 days. So careful planning has to go into their requirements like ventilation, sanitation and water to comply with Home Office regulations. In the Tombot Mark II design, the ventilation and filter units were sited in an area off the main centre. In Northampton, it was necessary to fit the VA1200 ventilation unit. This provides 2,400 cubic metres of air on a pre-filter operation and 1,200 cubic metres per hour on gas filter. The air would first be drawn into the air chamber through the EPV AF explosion protection valve fitted with air filters. The filtered air would then be ducted from the air chamber to the ventilating unit and distributed as required into the main centre. When the ventilation unit is switched on, airflow is maintained by passing the used air passed through over pressure valves into the airlock, through more valves into the decontamination area, and finally to the outside through a further set. When the ventilation unit is switched off, the overpressure valves automatically close again. The overpressure valves are selected to ensure 24 millimetres of overpressure on the water gauge in the main centre itself, with 16 millimetres in the airlock and 8 millimetres in the decontamination area. On gas filter operation, 
the overpressures would reduce accordingly. All aspects can be hand operated in the event of a power failure such as a generator breakdown. Of course, in an emergency situation, you'd need two people to do this. In the event of an emergency, the usual services we take for granted, water, sanitation, etc., can't be relied upon. So overcoming these problems has led to the design of toilets, wash basins and sinks that are self-contained, such as the 24-inch Elsan toilets with only 1.5 gallons of water and one pint of Elsan fluid. It will provide 250 uses and last 10 people five days before needing to be discharged therefore avoiding the need for any main supply. The three toilets here have been connected to a common manifold. Each one is isolated by a gate valve and discharged using a whale gusher pump. The water supply for the toilets, washroom sink tanks and kitchen sink tanks is all stored in the tank room. These tanks are galvanized and etched with MP302 and treated with Boa Coat 30 to ensure the keeping of potable water. Fiberglass tanks of the same size, 1,000 by 750 by 1,500, are also available and comply with bylaw 30. The ABP pump and filter draws its water from the storage tanks, ensuring a filtered supply at the point of delivery. The stainless steel sink tanks hold their own wastewater. The washroom sink tanks hold 30 gallons, whereas the kitchen sink tanks hold 50 gallons. When they're full, the waste is pumped outside, again using a whale gusher pump through a 1.5-inch non-kink smoothbore hose, eliminating any need for large sanitation holding tanks. Because of the centre's dual role, the dormitory is not a permanent feature. The bunk beds here, though, can be erected quickly, should the need arise. An RD81 radiation meter should be sited within the protected area, with an external probe facility situated outside. It enables people to read the level of radiation outside before anyone leaves the protected area. This particular meter can also be used as a handheld instrument, making it very cost effective. Due to the construction, it's important at the design stage to establish exactly where all the various services are to penetrate the wall structure. This is in order that sufficient wall tubes with puddle flanges can be cast into concrete walls. We'll now highlight the various transits used in the Northampton build. These have to be cast into the walls and are specified to match the wall's thickness. On the plan, the walls and doors that would sustain a blast are coloured dark brown, whereas the internal structural walls and pressure doors are coloured light brown. The actual thickness of the walls depend on the type of construction, the reinforcement used, the building above, etc. But in this case, they are 400 millimetres and 300 millimetres, respectively. Number one, the air intakes. These are shown green on the plan, with the casings having a flange on the inside to attach the explosion protection valve and air filter to. Number two, shown blue on the plan, are the wall casings for the overpressure valves. These are cast into the walls in the areas shown here. Number three, the generator exhaust, shown here in light blue. Number four, air exhaust for the generator room is ducted to the outside through blast valves, shown here in blue. Number five, cable transits. Where cables and pipes penetrate the structural walls, these are shown yellow. Number six, where water and sanitation pipes penetrate external walls, Stainless steel water transits need to be incorporated to avoid corrosion problems. And these are shown in orange. We'll now look at the construction of this building to highlight the key points. Once the wall thicknesses and transits have been specified and cited by the architect, the actual construction of the building is no different from any other build with the exception of the doors. Installing the transits is simply a matter of securing them between the shuttering boards prior to casting the walls. 
The valves are subsequently fitted, and this will be shown later. Probably the most important consideration in construction are the doors. The blast and pressure doors are supplied already hung and attached to their frames. The blast doors are 200 millimeters thick to give sufficient blast protection and ensure an adequate PF. Pressure doors used for internal closures are 100 millimeters thick. Here we see the doors as they're delivered. They should be inspected prior to shuttering to ensure that no damage has taken place whilst on site. You should assure yourself that the door and frame are true to each other in all respects and that the seals compress fully when the door is closed. The locking handles must not be removed or slackened either before or during casting. When casting the door frame, the door and frame should be placed inside shuttering and wedged accurately, ensuring that the frame is not twisted in any direction, as this will result in the door not sealing properly. The door body must be supported underneath, making sure it's in the fully closed position, with the locking handles fully horizontal. The door frame is then cast into the wall. It's important that under no circumstances should the frame be cast with the door in the open or unlocked position. When casting the door body, the door should not be cast until the wall is sufficiently cured. Formwork for shuttering is available on hire from ourselves. These are used in conjunction with the snap ties which are supplied with the door. Before casting the door body, it should be supported underneath, making sure it's in the fully closed position with the locking handles fully horizontal. Again, it's important that under no circumstances should the door body be cast in the open or unlocked position. If ordinary shutter boards are used by the builder, then care must be taken to ensure they're not over-tightened, as this may lead to distortion of the door body, which could result in the door not properly sealing to the frame. Ventilation air intake wall sleeve. This is cast into the air chamber wall. It provides an airtight passage through the structure. The embellished end is on the air chamber side and allows a smooth air passage. The opposite end provides the fixings for ductwork connections. These wall sleeves can be supplied in various dimensions and suit wall thicknesses. Wall sleeve. These are used where it's necessary for the ductwork to pass through the structure. The sleeve is cast into the wall, providing the necessary fixings for ductwork. Again, supplied in various dimensions and to suit wall thickness. Explosion protection valves. EPV, as the name suggests, protects air intakes and outlets against blasts. They work by having a shutting disc mounted on springs inside the casing. On impact of a blast wave, the shutting disc automatically closes onto the ceiling surface in the sheltered protection direction. This stops the airflow immediately. The following reverse suction wave that occurs will then pull the disc in the opposite direction, sealing the airflow and therefore protecting the shelter. First, the protective disc cover that prevented concrete entering the sleeve when it was cast is removed, exposing the mounting bolts. The valve is then bolted into position using the eight nuts, which are tightened to 42 newton meters each. If the valve is used as an air intake, an air filter will need to be added. This is done by means of the four studs on the filter rim being secured to the blast valve securing flange. The air filter. 
This is mounted over the blast valve. The valve protects the soft filter material from any sudden rise in pressure, up to a blast of three atmospheres and 11 atmospheres of reflective pressure. Overpressure valves. These are used on the exhaust air from the shelter. They enable differential overpressure to be maintained in the protected area, airlock and decon. They also have blast valve protection. In this shelter, they're sited here. The ventilating unit produces an increase in pressure in the control center and the overpressure valves release air out through the various rooms and finally to the outside. If the ventilating unit is set to recirculation, the overpressures would then drop and the valves would automatically close. The installation for the overpressure valve is exactly the same as the blast valve. The wall casing, together with its valve bed, is cast into the concrete structure. Protection screens are inserted into the wall tube to prevent vermin entering into the blast valve. In exposed blast situations, a splinter plate is bolted to the structure over the aperture to prevent debris entering the wall tube. The splinter plate stands off the wall surface sufficiently to minimize air resistance. Gas tight shut off valves. The GAC valves are used to shut off or change over the airflow in the ducting systems. By means of these gas tight shut off valves, the air can be directed according to the requirements for fresh air or filtered air operation. They work by opening and closing a stainless steel disc. If the handle is turned right round, the disc pushes forward, creating a gas tight seal. It's important when installing these that the system is totally sealed. The first part of installation is to fit the spacer duct. The spacer duct is mounted onto the air intake tube that has been pre-cast into the walls. The valve is then fitted onto the spacer ring, making sure that the gaskets are installed correctly to form the gas tight seal. Ducting is then added from this to the ventilating unit. All ductwork between the air chamber and gas filters must be gas tight. Generator exhaust. The exhaust system for the generator needs to be ducted to the outside where it penetrates an unprotected outside wall. An exhaust pipe wall sleeve needs to be incorporated to prevent any blast from entering the shelter. A wall sleeve for this purpose would be precast into the concrete. This would then allow the exhaust pipe to be fitted in the manner shown. Here, we're demonstrating the installation of the generator wall passage into its wall sleeve. The inner pipe is passed through the wall sleeve from the outside. It is then secured to the wall frame, onto the studs, and bolted down. The four yellow-capped threaded holes are for fixing the generator exhaust on the outside of the shelter. Inside the shelter, the exhaust protrudes into the generator room. The exhaust from the generator is then connected to this flange. Insulation must be packed into the wall casing to prevent heat damage to the wall. Finally, the two half plates are fitted. K2 
cable transit. Cable runs, water pipes, etc., need to be passed through the external walls. Sealing is required to provide adequate blast protection, and this is done by using a Brackberg 2000 cable transit fitting. The system comprises of various components. This ensures sealing against blast, fire, gas, etc. The mounting frame is cast into the structure and all the cables are run through. An important note is, though, that enough slack is left in the cables and pipes for subsequent assembly to occur. The fitting of these blocks around the cables is a simple procedure. Place the largest cables as low as possible in the frame. Care must be taken that the correct size blocks are used. Surfaces must be waxed to ease installation and help provide a perfect seal. The surface, which is in contact with the pipe and cable, however, must not be waxed. The layers are built up stage by stage. The compression plate is then inserted before the final layer. The bolt is then tightened, compressing the Lycron until there's 32 millimeters of space between the plate and the frame. is installed around the compression bolt and the end packing inserted into the frame using a hammer. Finally, the nuts of the end packing are tightened to compress and complete the seal. Approximately 12 millimeters of thread should protrude on each bolt. RGP. Other types and sizes of wall passages are available. The RGP can be inserted into wall tube already cast or can be fitted into a core drilled hole when used in existing structures. 
water sanitation. Where a water supply is required to penetrate the walls, a water sleeve for water sanitation should be cast into the wall at the construction stage. These are made of stainless steel to prevent corrosion and threaded both ends to connect to the water supply pipe. The flange at the centre is provided to prevent the capillary action of groundwater from seeping into the shelter. These pipes can be obtained at various dimensions to suit wall thickness. VA300. Here we're showing a VA300 ventilating unit complete with gas filter. This type of ventilation unit has an electrical motor and also a hand operation facility in the event of loss of power. This would enable the control to remain habitable whilst power was restored. The VA300 ventilating unit is designed primarily for emergency use only. The same principles apply as with the VA1200 unit already shown. The air is drawn through the valves and filters sited in the air chamber by the fan on the ventilating unit, then ducted as required to distribution. Allowing 8 CFM per person, the VA300 ventilating unit will support 20 people on gas filter operation. The units can be mounted in parallel where more air is required and simply connected to a common duct from the air chamber and to distribution. A recirc facility should be provided incorporating GAC valves. Decontamination. Here we're showing a decontamination shower unit together with a hydro fresh pump and water storage tank. For demonstration purposes, we're showing these components in a free field situation. The siting of the storage tank and pump need not necessarily be in the decontamination area. If space permits, however, siting these items together is usually more convenient. Here we see a person decontaminating himself in the shower. He's wearing a waterproof suit. A surfactant, or decontaminant, is usually added to this water. The decontamination procedures are a complete subject on their own. Depending on the type of contamination and the type of suit worn would determine the method of decontamination. For local authority emergency control centres, it's not expected that the traffic through the decon would be very great during an emergency. The main use of the decon facility would be for people attending the generator room Therefore, a very basic and minimal decon facility is provided by way of one airlock and one decon area. However, people should familiarise themselves with the correct procedures of decontamination. In military situations where many people would pass through the decon area, it's not unusual to have as many as eight separate areas with varying overpressures and a very strict doffing and donning procedures must be adhered to. This, of course, involves the training of such people in simulated and real conditions. However, these local authority emergency control centres will in the main be occupied by civilians. Therefore, it's of great importance that the emergency planning officer ensures that his team is aware of this problem and the necessary training given. Electromagnetic pulse protection. The subject of EMP protection is an extremely complex one, and progress is rapidly being made on this front. For instance, credible alternatives to the Faraday cage or steel room. However, we feel that unless total EMP protection is given, taking into account all vulnerable points, it's rather a waste of resources, for example, to EMP protect the generator set and assume that we'll put the radio in a biscuit tin to bring out after the blast. For installations where it's not practicable to have the bunk beds permanently erected and storage unassembled is not desired, we show a new concept allowing the beds to be assembled ready for use whilst at the same time being stored on the ceiling, freeing the floor space beneath to be used on a day-to-day -day basis. When the beds are required, they're simply lowered from the ceiling and the four uprights inserted. The washable and fire-resistant polypropylene material which forms the base of the bed is supple enough for a mattress not to be required. The bunk bed frames are made from powder-coated steel tubes, with the connection pieces from POM polymer ensuring durability and long life. The information given in this video is in good faith. However, care must be taken by the designers to ensure that the local authorities' individual requirements are complied with. 
and of course they finally have home office approval. This must be given before a grant is available. Each build will obviously vary in some way according to local conditions and restrictions. However, in order to clarify some of the general points made in the EPGLA, we would state the following. Point one. The space requirement of 700 cubic feet per person applies when no forced ventilation is provided. Where a ventilation system has been installed, airspace requirements per person may be varied below this figure, operational requirements being the determining factor. Point two. Home office grant provides for the funding of wartime controls. Where dual use is proposed, consideration should be given to air changes, improved sanitation, washroom and kitchen facilities, as well as health and safety requirements outside of the grant. Point three, the 1.5 PSI requirement found in the EPGLA is not intended to be built down to. Therefore, when designing a new build which might require 400 millimeters of reinforced concrete walls to withstand the weight of earth and an above build, we should not then reduce the blast protection for the doors, inlet and outlet valves to 1.5 PSI, as this would not produce a credible build. And point four, the recommended height for air intake stated in the EPGLA is seven feet. Again, this is not a fixed figure. Individual circumstances may be taken into account and reduced height accepted. 